So as a Christian, you live in a world that is ordered on lines that are substantially part of the cosmic rebellion against God. Born, in the words of Arthur Matthew's book title, you were born for battle. It's an old book, but a great one. And it talks about the spiritual conflict that you're naturally in as one who's part of the kingdom of God when the enemy has so much say still in the world in which we live. We're in a battle. And the trouble with this battle is that like many modern conflicts, the battle is not carried out simply out there. There's a large part of the battle that happens on the home front as well, in here. And the most neglected front, if you see it in those terms, in that battle in here, seems to be to be addressed in Psalm 33, which has spoken to me this week and I share it with you on that basis. Now the background of Psalm 33 is clearly one where injustice is perpetrated, enemies attack, all the usual things that depress us and get us down are there in the background of Psalm 33. But the psalmist appears to realise that this, in here, is where the key battles are fought and addresses that issue throughout this psalm, the battles on the home front, the battles within, the Trojan horse stuff. And the truth is that grief happens in a fallen world. But this psalmist militantly refuses to allow that to set his agenda or dominate his worldview. He won't let it in. And in setting that out for us, in setting out his handling of these things that are trying to come in and oppress and be the enemy within, but spread the darkness on the inside, in setting out his approach to that for us, he demonstrates how to approach the absolutely vital battle of the viewpoints. The decisive battle that's fought deep within me. Don't let the darkness into your head. Unless that battle gets won, the battles against sin and the flesh and the devil are lost because morale is crucial to victory in any context particularly in asymmetric warfare, which is the sort of situation we've got given that the enemy is defeated, but he keeps on mucking about. The weapons and the strategy that the psalmist consciously deploys are conspicuously on display in Psalm 33. As he pits what he knows against what he sees with his eyes and against what his imagination fears on the basis of merely observable phenomena. And what he says is this, he says, well, guys, sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous ones. Sing. We'll see, you can see in this psalm, he's got things stacked up against him. He says, right, guys, here's where we go. Let's have a song. You love people like that, don't you? Just when the sky's caving in and everything's going grim and black and grim and horrible, somebody says, let's have a song. And you think, no, let's punch you on the nose. You know, that sort of situation. Augustine had some quote about somebody who sings in the morning and it's like, I don't know, I can't remember what it was. But, but you, know, you know the sort of thing, it's a song. Well, it's like this, God loves to hear his people sing. And some of us might want to say, singing is not my thing. Hmm. Maybe not. But God, God says to sing. He doesn't say sing beautifully. He certainly doesn't even say sing melodiously. He says sing joyfully in righteousness of heart. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. We'd be wrong to minimise the importance of the spiritual discipline of song. It wouldn't be good for us, it wouldn't please God. So at times of pressure, just looking at it, myself looking back I think it's fair to say as at times of pressure on our family we've been encouraged to hear our children go off into their own time in their own space and we can suddenly we can hear them singing and, and here's a little picture of God you know uh, he sees his, his, his little ones he sees his flock and he sees the pressures and he sees and he and then he notices they've gone off and he hears them singing and the joy of his heart is immense I take that blessed experience as some small paradigm for the pleasure that God takes in hearing his children sing here in this fallen creation. So here's the big idea. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. It's fitting. I know what's happening. I know what's going on. I know, take it, take it to David 
is the psalmist. There are texts that say that he isn't. There are texts that say that he isn't. So we obviously don't really need to know. But take that it's David. And take that he's got the forces of darkness arrayed against him. And he's, he's the first one to try and unite the, the, the monarchy and bring the land together. And, and he's got all these forces of Philistines and you know, invading peoples of all around. He's got the weight of the nation on his shoulders. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. You don't feel like it. You don't feel particularly keen on the idea. But sing. Sing because of God. And because of where he puts you. And because of where you stand with him. And because it is, there's something just right about God's people singing his praises and don't just sing it maybe you've got a cop out here if you don't think singing is your thing it may be instruments are your thing we'll get you a drum or something you can bang something um, but uh, he goes on from saying sing joyfully to the Lord he says praise the Lord with the harp then you know make music to him on the ten stringed lyre sing to him a new song play skillfully This verse speaks about two instruments. It speaks about the lyre and the harp. No doubt there were plenty of other similar instruments kicking around the back rooms of the pubs of the Middle East and Bronze Age. In fact, there are music books we've discovered with the chords. A bit like, you know, the Christian chorus books you get. You get the music version and the chords are in there. We've discovered from Rash Shamra, ancient pagan hymns, with the chords all written on for the lyre. So we know it was going on in that period. And I know there are strands of Christian teaching, tradition, that teach only singing is allowed in church. It's a gap in my training that I don't know how they may deal with verses like this. But in biblical worship, let's say this, there are harps. A thing of beauty is the harp, and so is the music that comes from it, beauty. And in the crises and in the pressures that underlie this psalm, aesthetics are still important because they speak of the beauty that God has put in his creation. And they speak of being creative the way God is creative in, in himself. And it reflects the character of God, despite the fact the enemy is trying to have his way in the world. We're not going to let him. We're going to sing and we're going to make music and we're going to play the harp and bang the drum, whatever it is we're going to do, because it reflects God in a world that is in rebellion against him. And I've got lessons to learn there myself we need to go on expressing the creativeness of God as his creatures made in his image maybe doing that defiantly even in the deserts of desperation and if there are church traditions now that find instruments hard and we don't see where they're coming from the next bit puts us in their position singing playing instruments and shouting now hang on hang on hang on here's the big idea still Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous, fitness for the upright to, fit, fitting for the upright to praise him. No instruments. Praise the Lord with a harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully, defiantly if necessary, but do that. And shout for joy. Shouting in church. I mean, not from the pulpit. That's perfectly acceptable, of course. But, but you know, huh? shout to God for joy? Surely not. Well, read it for yourself and tell me about it afterwards. The big idea is that the people of God, when under pressure and the world wears them down, uh, they should roll back the darkness with praise, particularly on the inside, and not let the darkness in. Music, singing and playing, shouts of praise. Now, 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 now come on, let's be frank here, okay? Singing is easy in heaven, right? Singing is easy in heaven. There's nothing to stop you singing in heaven. Heaven's a great place. You'll want to sing in heaven. When we are set free from sins, foul oppression, that is how it genuinely be, will be. And in this experience of life now, on the other hand, it can be hard to do that. But singing exalts God and his glory here below and is helpful to the people of God. It's therapeutic because it is fitting, appropriate, right. For the powerful, for the wealthy, now, for the upright, though threatened and oppressed, to step out in the gloom and praise him because he is worthy of praise. And you want to say, but it's hard. Yes, it's hard. So what helps? Pretty much the rest of what follows in Psalm 33 addresses that. Maybe it'd be good to give that psalm a read. <laughs> 